Good evening. I've spoken before about my struggles with anxiety. Today I want to touch on a closely related topic, insecurity. We know insecurity is an issue for us when we frequently compare ourselves with others or when the need for approval or lack of it from other people becomes a problem. For instance, if someone makes it clear they don't like me or what I do or say, do I start to doubt my identity and validity as a human being? It's embarrassing, but even as a 62-year-old man who's been in, in ordained Christian ministry for 35 years, a Christian for 45, I have to admit that insecurity can still rear its head in me. To my shame, since we've been posting these videos on YouTube, I'm not completely immune from looking to see how many views I've had, and what's worse, comparing with other churches and preachers, often unfavourably. I wouldn't say this has become a major problem, but it has made me realise how a young person struggling with identity and self-worth could become addicted to the approval social media seems to give and how devastating it can be if the friends and likes disappear. At the root of insecurity is doubt as to whether who I am is good enough or worthy to be loved. It's a powerful force in this world leading to much private misery and public conflict when we feel our identity and worth are under attack, we either retreat into ourselves or hit back defensively at the other person. Needless to say, neither reaction has a very positive outcome. But I also want to say this. At those times when I've been most aware of the Holy Spirit at work in me, he's brought a strong sense of God's acceptance and approval. For instance, I remember being at a conference at Holy Trinity Brompton in the mid-90s at the height of the early explosion of Alpha when the verses we're about to look at spoke powerfully and personally to me. I'd been going through a bit of a wilderness experience, ten years into ministry, doubting whether anything I was doing made any difference and struggling with anxiety, insecurity and low self-esteem as a result. I guess someone may have spoken on this passage, though if they did I don't remember the sermon. All I remember is the truth of these verses hitting me in a new and powerful way. I'd like to call what I felt something spiritual, like joy or anointing but actually the overwhelming emotion was relief. It was a feeling of, ah, so God does love me after all. I don't have to strive for his acceptance or earn his love. I'm accepted and adopted as his child because of what Jesus has done. And now the Holy Spirit is making it real in my experience. Well, those verses were Romans chapter 8, 15 to 17. Romans 8, 15 to 17. The spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. There's an almost identical passage in Galatians 4, 4-7, so this is clearly a central element of Paul's Gospel. In both, Paul contrasts our previous state status as slaves with our new position as children of God. 
The Spirit reveals the amazing privilege we've been given of being adopted as God's children through Jesus. The wording refers to a practice in Roman law whereby somebody who is not a natural born son could be afforded the rights, privilege, privileges and intimate relationship of a male heir. Paul says we were once slaves to sin, death and the devil, but now we're accepted and adopted as God's children and as God's heirs. And the Holy Spirit makes it real in our experience. We cry, Abba, Father. In my experience, that sense of God's acceptance, approval, applause and adoption is a powerful antidote to those ever-present feelings of insecurity, inadequacy, inferiority and what's called the imposter syndrome where you're constantly feeling you don't deserve to be where you are in life and are about to be exposed as a fraud. If that's the way you sometimes feel, here's a good prayer to pray, daily if need be. Father, let me know by the Spirit that I'm accepted and adopted in Jesus the Son. Father, let me know by the Spirit that I'm accepted and adopted in Jesus the Son. I can't help noticing, however, that in those verses, Paul unintentionally refers to two hugely sensitive issues of justice and equality in our world. By talking about slaves, and fathers and sons, he's touching two very raw nerves in contemporary culture. I can't speak on those subjects in anything like the fullness that I would like to, but let me just add a footnote on both. Slavery and its legacy is all over the news at the moment, with George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, and the debate about toppling statues. Paul makes it clear that slavery is an evil. Its dominant emotions are fear, worthlessness and lack of identity, freedom and dignity. However, some find it disappointing that Paul takes a pragmatic approach when addressing slaves. Take your freedom if you can get it, but if you can't, find a way to live for Christ within the system. People understandably feel that if Paul had taken a stronger stand against slavery, it would have been harder for some of our Christian ancestors to have been silently complicit or actively involved in the evil of the slave trade. We can't know the answer to that. But we must say, as Archbishop Justin has done, that we are deeply sorry and ashamed of the actions of some of our Christian ancestors, and we repent of institutional racism which still exists both in the church and in society. Yes, we celebrate the lives of people like John Newton and William Wilberforce who took a stand against slavery in their day. But would we have had the clear-sightedness and moral courage to do the same? I find that a very uncomfortable question. Paul's argument here is also difficult because the language of his day is all about fathers and sons rather than the more inclusive phrase parents and children. Most modern Bibles translate the Greek word sons of God as children of God. I believe that's right because in our culture child conveys Paul's meaning an intimate relationship with full rights of inheritance, better than son does. Just as Bible translators have to find the right vocabulary to convey the original meaning to different cultures, 
we have to recognise that English words change their meanings and associations over time and therefore translations need to be revised. So I don't have a problem with children of God replacing sons of God. However, I do hope, fully accepting gender equality, that we will be able to continue to call God our Father. Somehow parent doesn't quite do it for me. Now this is probably a vast oversimplification, but my understanding of child development is that while children can adapt and thrive in a wide range of family situations, the optimum context for a growing child is to have both mother and father present. Again, I'm probably oversimplifying, but in the early years the role of the mother is all important, providing a foundation of intimacy, security and unconditional love. However, as the child begins to transition to adulthood, the father has a key role in establishing self-worth and security in one's identity. Now that's not to say that that role can't be provided by a mother or another significant adult if need be, but there is a distinctive contribution by the father figure. Arguably, many emotional and social problems in society stem from absent or inadequate fathers. We need the intimate, nurturing, mother-like side of God's nature sometimes neglected perhaps, but we also need the acceptance, approval and adoption that Father God provides. So if like me you find anxiety and insecurity inconveniently raise their heads a little too often, this work of the Spirit is a great blessing and relief that he testifies with our spirits that we are children of God. He makes the fact of our acceptance and adoption move from our heads to our hearts in a deep inner knowing of God as Father. I don't know why I so often need to experience that afresh, but I do. So let me encourage you to pray that prayer with me. Father God, let me know by the Spirit that I'm accepted and adopted in Jesus the Son. In my day we used to sing, Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist without the knowledge of your parenthood and your loving care. But now I am your child, I'm adopted in your family and I can never be alone because Father God you're there beside me. More recently, the same truth is beautifully expressed in the Bethel song, I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. You may want to Google those two songs and play them again before bed. I'm going to end with those verses from Romans in the message. The resurrection life you received from God isn't a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who He is and we know who we are, Father and children. And we know we're going to get what's coming to us an unbelievable inheritance. Father God, let us know by your Spirit that we're accepted and adopted in Jesus, your Son. Amen.